Welcome home, Big Meech. Big Meech was recently welcomed home by LeBron James in a tweet, as well as other celebrities welcoming home Big Meech. Check them out. Streets are back. Meech on. Meech, welcome back. Salute, my. For those who don't know who Big Meech is, Big Meech was the uh, one of the founders of BMF, Black Mafia Family, born in Detroit 1968, rose to power of one of the largest drug syndicates in the country, maybe even the world, was arrested in 2005, eventually sentenced to 30 years in prison in 2008, and now he's getting let out because of uh, good behavior, and he's coming home, and a lot of folks are happy that he's coming home, as we just saw, but a lot of folks are not so happy with this welcome. They're not so happy that, as you see here from these other tweets, of people saying, hey, this guy sold drugs, he shouldn't be welcomed home, you know, he's a drug dealer, why are we celebrating this? And I get it, you know, listen, I understand both sides. Let's talk first about the negative financial implications about selling drugs into communities and how it impacts the community. The first one is increased crime rates. There's a positive correlation between poverty and crime. So the more drugs in your community, the more crime in your community, the more poverty in your community. Number two, decreased property values. The more drugs in your community, the property values in your community plummet. I can attest to this. 5956 Stanton is where my grandmother lived. So I would watch, literally watch throughout her back window across the street, uh, through the backyard across the street. I would see all these drugs being sold, these fancy cars coming in the morning. The runner would come up, give the car person the drugs. They would drive off and go back to their neighborhood. So where the neighborhood they were coming, now these are some of the most fanciest cars I've ever seen in my life. BMWs, Benz, but they didn't live there. They just came to buy their drugs there. And then they would go back. And, and I say, most of them in that community who were driving were white that we saw. They were mostly white. They would get the drugs and then go back to their part of the community. But the community in which they were buying the drugs from, that was a very hard community. It was a very rough community. So the property value in that community, because of the drugs and other crime, plummeted. Number three, reduced economic investment. If you're looking to build a business or invest in a community, buy homes, you're going to go to the community. You see drugs in that community, you're going to decide, hey, you know what? Let's take our money elsewhere. So that happened a lot in any drug-infested communities. Number four, increased health care costs. Of course, as like my uncle, he fell victim to drugs. And his health care costs were through the roof because he always had to get treatment. So in that particular community, health care costs rise because of drug infestation. Five, loss of productivity. So of course, people like my uncle could no longer work. And as brilliant as he was, he's a brilliant artist, and he worked for GM, had to take that early buyout package. He took it to put, with the money, he bought drugs. So the productivity of the community plummets because of drug use. Number six, strain on social services. I can also personally attest to this because I travel across the country, and many of those organizations that I partner and teach are organizations that offer substance abuse programs. I do that because I know that financial education is an integral component in getting people reintegrated back into society, whether you are coming from prison or just getting over a very hard drug habit. So I teach financial education, try to get them back on their feet, at least learning how to budget, learning how to improve their credit, learning about the proper mindset. And I've heard many stories, not only from the people who are in those programs, but also from the counselors who are overworked, underpaid, and overstressed because of the amount of traffic that they have to get and attend to trying to deal with people living very hard lives because of drugs. Number seven, increased legal and criminal costs. The judges, the district attorney, the prosecutors, all those folks in that system, they don't work for free. Those are taxpayer dollars. And so the more drug you have, the more crime you have, the more poverty you have, the more people you have that can't afford attorneys, they have to get one appointed to them. Somebody has to pay for it. We have to step in and put, foot that bill as taxpayers. Number eight, decreased quality of life. Again, I can personally attest when we lived on Stanton, that quality of life, I love being over there. I love my grandmother. But we all knew that that neighborhood was not the safest neighborhood to be in because of drugs. Number nine, loss of human capital. Again, individuals, because of drugs, drop out of the workforce. We have less productivity. That human capital cannot add to the overall economic value of that community. Number 10, generational impacts. Generation upon generation of individuals seeing and witnessing 
This level of drugs has absolutely negative financial implications on the development of that child and their children. Number 11, increased insurance costs. Of course, we want to complain about redlining and certain targeted areas, but the insurance costs, when they look at health care costs and the amount of money that it costs in order to provide care for those individuals, we're going to see an increase in premium, which actually decreases the overall economic value of that community because we have to pay more money for health care costs and higher premiums, and, it, and the entire community has to pay for that drug activity. Number 12, impact on local taxes. When you see a declining economy, when you see exiting businesses, you see a lower tax base where we don't collect as much tax revenue as we should in order to pay for the social services, pay for the health care, because folks are leaving. We saw that in Detroit, where BMS was, was from. We saw flight. People saying, look, we're getting the heck out of here because we see this economic activity. Now, again, the ironic part is that they'll come over here to buy the drugs, but then they'll leave behind the economic blight because of the drugs. So, Big Meech, I would like to talk directly to you. First of all, I'd like to say welcome home. I'm glad you're home. I'm glad you're home. I do a lot of work with those who are in prison and returning citizens across this country, so I don't judge. I'm not, I'm not, I never come from a judgmental perspective, and as far as I'm concerned, you did your time. You deserve to be home. But doesn't mean I don't think you got a lot of work to do to make up what you did. And I have some ideas. So I'm not just here to wag my finger at you. To, no, I have some ideas. I have ideas because of all those celebrities that we saw and all that attention that you have, I have a way that we can work together to make money, to make millions. I'm not talking about charity, to make millions and do good for the community. Let me explain it in just four words. Save money, build credit. Save money, build credit. So Ryan, what, what does that have to do with making money? Well, if I say those words, save money, Build credit. If I say those words, people say, well, Ryan, you've written five books about it. You co-authored two. You're always on CNN. Whatever. You're always talking about that stuff. Whatever. It's not exciting. But Big Meech, if you say those words, people will listen because they're not expecting you to talk about financial education. And then it's not like you can't say that. Save money, build credit. We'll say, well, the next question is say, okay, Big Meech. I guess we should save money. I saw you blowing money, but you, you, you want me to save money? So, But the next question I'll ask, Big Meech, is how? And that's where we start talking about the money. How? Save money, build credit. There's not a financial institution in this country who would not be interested in serving the people who know you. I'm going to say that again. There's not a financial institution in this country who would not be interested in serving the people who know you. So you have access. And especially with these celebrities who you have, you can say, hey, uh, uh, Rick Ross. Hey, LeBron. Hey, uh, I need you to save money, build credit. Just say those words. Let's put them on a video sponsored by Chase. Sponsored by Bank of America, sponsored by HSBC, sponsored by Wells Fargo, sponsored by PNC. You get what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is this. We have, through Main Street, a mechanism to teach financial literacy. And through this thing right here, this is our economic hotline. We also have over 20,000 nonprofits across this country that we have access to, that we can look up via zip code and city. So if someone texts this number and they text a question, they'll get a response. And then we will answer their question and then refer them to a free resource in their community. You can help promote this, but you can also help promote other solutions that people can actually implement the, the solutions that we teach in our classes. And that is a revenue stream that my brother could make you millions. And that is a revenue stream that not only would make you, and I know this because I've raised over $4 million for Operation Hope. Over $3 million I raised in the Detroit area. 
PMC, Fifth Third Bank, Skillman, Level One Bank, other institutions I've raised, and many of those institutions were only expecting us to get 250 people per month. 250 people per month, the Level One Bank cut us a check for a quarter million dollars. You do the math, my brother. So I say that to say, I listed a whole lot of negative things. And a lot of things that your activity did that had negative financial implications on the community. What I'm asking you now is, let's work together to rebuild what was once broken. Let's work together to teach and inspire and empower our communities, to uplift our communities, to build economic value and create intergenerational wealth that I think you would want to see from your community and our community in Detroit. My uncle passed, and I'm quite sure, because he was in the late 80s, early 90s, I'm quite sure that that was pretty close to where you were doing the most. I'm quite sure he was buying from you. That hurts, bruh. That hurts. My uncle's no longer here. But I forgive you. But I know there's a lot of other folks out there that like my uncle. A lot of them, my brother. And I'm saying, and this ain't no nonprofit idea I'm talking about. Here's my email. Here's my number. Text me. Let's set up a time. Let's sit down and chop it up. So that all these folks out here welcoming you home, let's put them to work, man. Let's put them to work. Let's organize these financial institutions to have a systemic educational platform to build wealth for our communities that we all want to see. I hope to hear from you. Peace. Mm -hmm.